Just a few more things about research data. Um, data is collected for the purpose of analysis and validating original results, right? These are, these are very important things to keep in mind. And uh, data is the lowest level of, of abstraction in which information are derived. So like the Borgman and like the gold definitions we visited a little bit earlier, they suggested that research data is the foundation of scholarship. And well, if it's the lowest level of abstraction, you know, at least the knowledge, it's the bits and bytes that create, you know, the final image that is your research project. On the computer. And folks, just forgive me while I scroll through my notes and just make sure that I don't forget to tell you things. Because I have like 13 pages of notes. <laughs> So data means different things to different people. I work with a lot of librarians because I'm a librarian, that's what we do. Um, and our coordinator for technology, when I first met her, she was like, so you want our digital repository to hold data. What well, already holds data. Bits and bytes are data. Anything that's digital that's on the web is data. Okay? I didn't think that, and I disagreed, but um, the one thing I needed to keep in mind is that it's all in context. So for somebody who is a web developer, who puts things in a repository, anything that ingests into their repository is data. Whether it's a PDF of a journal article, whether it's a metadata file that describes a data set, or whether it's a CSV, or whether it's images, or anything, it's all data to them, because it's just bits and bytes. Um, on the contrary, some folks, including myself, consider a lot of analog material data itself. So if you're taking observations, you know, in the field, and writing in a notebook, just because it's not digital doesn't mean it's not data. The reason I didn't try to give you, uh, the reason I didn't try to categorize what is and what isn't data is because it's a very unproductive conversation that won't get us anywhere. Does that make sense? So we're going to go through types of research data. How many of you have had a class or nine in research methods? So some people haven't had research methods classes. So this might be new information to you. Um, we're going to discuss the main types of research data, so the most common, which are experimental, observational, simulated, and then we'll talk about some less common ones that are derived and uh, canonical. I actually have to look up how to say canonical for this presentation. You know when you only read a word, you don't know how to actually say it? <laughs> it happens to me sometimes. So as we work through some of these definitions, I want to remind you that this is foundational knowledge that you will need to draw back on later in the course. So just kind of keep notes on what is experimental, what's observational. And we'll start working through them. Observational data, most of these definitions are pretty self-explanatory. So it's information that's captured in real time. Um, so we have weather observations, um, survey data, satellite imagery. So if you're measuring uh, deforestation, uh, you take an aerial shot of the forest, you know, that's your observational data that you got from the satellite. To put things in context, though, observational data is um, it's unique. It's, it's captured in real time, which means it needs, to be, it needs to be managed effectively. Because if you lose observational data, what happens? What happens if we just all of a sudden, every record of ocean temperatures that we had in, in, every, you know, in every observation point, every buoy, let's just say all that wiped out and we lost all the ocean temperatures from 1980 to 1990. Well, you're done, because you can't reproduce that data. You can't simulate it, you can't run an experiment. Sure, you can do some forecasting and fill in the gaps. I learned tons about that in economics, but what I also learned in economics is that it's not very scientific and that it can be flawed. So anything that's observational data is extra sensitive because it's a snapshot in time, it's a time capsule. And if you lose it, you can't get it back. Experimental data is just that, right? You're quintessential, you're in a lab, you're mixing chemicals, um, you know, and you, you measure the results. So, clinical trials, you have your placebo group, then you have your group that actually receives the treatment. That in itself is an experiment. But what I wanted to know, right, because I'm not an oceanographer, what kind of experimental data do you all do? And I'm going to ask lots of questions and call on you a lot, so please be ready to engage. But are there any running experiments? Just collecting observations primarily? Okay. That's why I couldn't come up with a lot of cool ocean, oceanography examples of experimental data. But um, experimental data, right, it can be reproduced. You can run a clinical trial again. Um, you can go collect 
very similar samples, put them together in a lab and test them. You can mix the same chemicals, but it's going to be very expensive. And if you, you know, your supervisor is probably going to be very upset if you lose that data because it's expensive to reproduce. And um, you know, that's why it's important to manage. So every data type I show you, I'll tell you that it's important to manage because if I didn't think it was important, I wouldn't be talking to you. Simulation data. How many of you work with simulation data in your research? A couple folks. Right, these are models. Um, so it's data generated from a model. Something that I'm sure many of you are familiar with are climate models. Um, so they put in historical observations, um, current observations, all that stuff together in some sort of equation that many of you probably know and understand. And what comes out as a climate model predicts the future. Um, your weather forecast, you watch on the news. That's a model. There's a computer simulation that happens that gives the forecast or the numbers they use, um, you know, in their weather setting every day. One thing I want to say about this is, let's get a little sip of water. When you're working with model data, and I'm sure those of you who do can speak to this, what's more important than the actual output of your model is the description and the parameters of the simulation data you actually created. So, um, what does your model equation look like? What observational data are you feeding into it? Uh, what other data sources are you plugging into it? Um, how did you come up with these? Are your variables weighted? If they're, if they're weighted, then why are they weighted? All that is much more important than the information you get out of it. I'm sure all of you have read articles in The Economist and uh, The Wall Street Journal um, in Al Jazeera that say they'll have uh, like freedom indices. And what's that? You know, America scores 4.7 on the freedom index. Nobody knows what that means. But if you look and you follow and you trace yourself, you trace yourself backwards, you can actually usually look at the equation that they use to develop that. So they plugged in um, some of the things that might be used for a uh, freedom index would be the number of passports issued. Um, it could have to do with the political views of leaders. It could have to do with uh, unemployment rate. Um, have to do with certain laws. All of that feeds into something that produces a final number. So rather than focusing on the number, you focus on what goes into it, so that you can actually critically evaluate this data. So deriving compiled data, um, one thing you're going to notice as we start working through these types is data doesn't fit neatly into boxes all the time. So just because something's observational data doesn't mean that it isn't anything else. So derived data is the result of processing raw data. So when you look at census figures and you go and you pull up you know, Fort Lauderdale, you want to do a demographic profile, you have um, age cohorts, you have race cohorts, you have uh, unemployment, you have all these aggregate figures that are brought to you so that you can get a good understanding. Well, that in itself is a raw data, right? Because you're not looking at the census level respondent data. You're not looking at, you know, someone 209 Dogwood Avenue, four kids, two cars. You can study that stuff. Um, there's certain places you can go, but for most of us, it would be highly questionable to allow us to have access to that data. So most of what you work with uh, is derive your compiled data. Most of the results you're going to put in your papers are compiled data. Um, so it's often reproducible. It can be expensive and difficult, but um, that's another, that's another uh, data type to keep in mind. The last one's kind of weird, to be honest with you. Um, it's kind of a, it's just a mashup of a bunch of smaller data sets. So in essence, it could be observational data. It's just a bunch of different observational data sets pulled into one thing. So I think I actually made up an example for you guys. Let's see. Yeah, so think of a, think of a GIS product online that you all use, right, to, um, to make decisions about your research. You have a map online, and it's got ocean temperatures, it's got wind speed, and then when you click on little segments, right, little polygons on that map, you can click on sections of the ocean and it tells you what kind of fish are there by depth level, right? Um, does that exist? Probably something like that. Well, that's, that's an example of your canonical or your reference data. So the surface temperature observations are probably coming from buoys in the water. Um, the, uh, the water current, same situation. These are observational data captured by computers. But you also have other data sources feeding into it. So you have some sort of GIS technician or some sort of um, probably entry level person sitting at, at their desk at a lab just putting in, you know, so-and-so found this fish on this date, this this big. 
next slide, this fish, this state, this big. And then somebody in a totally other marine, and totally different marine institute is feeding that data different types of uh, microorganisms, uh, you know, algae, stuff like that. And, and you'll notice when I give examples, it'll become really clear that I'm a social scientist, so uh, please keep that in mind. That's why I like to ask you for your examples. Uh, but one of the most notable examples are gene data banks. Um, so multiple scientists, they deposit, uh, you know, like protein profiles and things like that into giant, into larger data sets, and scientists are able to make uh, breakthroughs based on information. For example, one of the genome databases um, is actually allowing researchers to understand why, uh, whenever there are kidney transplants, there's a very high rejection rate in kidney transplants. And we really don't know exactly why yet. But these gene data, data banks are making it more and more possible to understand the high, you know, the high uh, rejection rates for kidney transplants. And so you guys probably have similar data banks for, uh, for DNA of organisms that you sample, I'm assuming, in your field. So that would be an example of like a reference data set. And we're going to change, kind of change our tune a little bit and discuss primary versus secondary data. How many of you uh, know what a primary source is? Librarians know what a primary source is. So um, I'm not going to ask you all to give me your definition of a primary source. All right, primary source is information about an actual event. So if I was in the golf court, I was a war correspondent, which I wasn't. Um, but if I was sitting there and I was firsthand in a battle in the trenches taking notes, writing a story, my transcripts or my story that I write for Stars and Stripes, that is, um, that's primary data. That's a primary source. Um, if you're reading an account about a congressional hearing from somebody that was actually on the congressional floor or a reporter from the scene, that's primary data. Now say uh, 20 years from now, the historian wants to write a book about the battle that I observed. I wasn't the only person writing stories at that time. There are Marines, uh, so other soldiers who have seen that battle firsthand that were interviewed. There are photos that people took. All that information combined, someone could write a really cool book about a famous battle that happened a long time ago. That book in itself would be secondary source because it's not firsthand account information of what happened, it's secondhand account. So let's bring that around to data. Right? Go on a cruise, right? And the purpose of go, is that what we call it? You go on a cruise, is that when you ride a boat out for example? <laughs> so you go on a cruise and you're collecting, you know, you're collecting samples. And you take them back and you do your work. And that's your primary data. You're going to write a paper on that or um, you and your colleagues are all going to get together and work on those samples. That information, that is essentially your research, you collected it for the purpose of your project. But one day I'm going to decide to go back and get my PhD in oceanography because I see you guys having all this fun. And so I go back and I want to do an analysis of your data. So I have all kinds of samples of my own at different, uh, you know, water samples, I guess, at different depths. But what I don't have is samples from specific regions of the world. But I know you do because you put your data in a repository. So I go to the repository, I extract your data sets, and I just combine it with my other data sets so I don't have to capture the observations myself. It saves time. Same thing with surveys. If you wanted to, if you wanted to, if you're a science historian and you wanted to discuss what research data management meant to various oceanographers, you're not going to go survey the same people. If for name the librarian did that research five years ago, you could just get my data and use that and maybe modify it. Does that make sense? So what I want you to think about is, remember, I think it was Borgman's definition: data is outputs of research, inputs to subsequent sharing and learning. Your primary data is going to be somebody's secondary data. So you should treat it that way. Does that make sense? Oh, wrong computer. Every time I do that, I go all the way to the top of my notes. So let's go back down. Activity number two. You guys still have enough note cards? So this is the part where you think about a research project. You're going to have to write a data management plan at the end of today or at the end of uh, this week, right? So you're going to have to have some sort of hypothetical project that you really want to work on. It could be a project that you know about. It could be a project you're working on. But I want you to have a specific project in mind. Um, and I want you to pair up. It doesn't have to be the same, but I noticed you guys got your stuff out, so it might be more convenient to do it that way. 
give your partner um, an elevator speech, so that 90 second speech about what is my project, um, so that you all get to know each other a little bit and know about each other's work. Um, librarians pick, pick a project, I do this all the time with librarians, and you guys do cool data work too. So um, discuss your projects to each other, and then start listing off data types, or start listing off data. So if you're going to be, if you're a librarian and uh, putting on a survey, start, you know, list the survey, list the questionnaire. If you're collecting samples, list the samples, list, list your methodology. And I want you to be as expansive as possible. Uh, that's why I gave you multiple note cards, and I think we have more. And so talk to each other about each other's project. Write as many data types as you possibly can about your project. Consider the whole project, not just the beginning of going out and collecting samples, but all the way in the lab processing your work, sharing work with colleagues, conference papers, publications, things like that, your final data set, your final charts and figures for your paper. Think about all that and write as many of it down in a note card and help each other out because you guys are going to think of different data types for each other's project that they're not thinking about. So if someone's doing a survey, I might say, well, what about the questionnaire? That's data too because I really can't do much of your results without the actual survey instrument you use. Does that make sense? So I'll give you uh, about five minutes or so to pair and share and work together. And uh, I'll come by and see how you all are doing. And um, I can ask you to read all of them out loud. So just you know, work amongst yourselves.